Continuing where I left off, Chapter 5. Meanwhile, Nikolov Rostov remained at his post waiting for the wolf. He sensed what was happening in the preserve by the way the hunt approached and receded. From the yelps of the dogs, whose notes were familiar to him, and from the rising voices of the whips, now rear, now far, he knew that there were young and old wolves in the preserve, knew that the hounds had separated into two packs, that somewhere they were running the quarry and that something had gone wrong. Every moment he expected the wolf to come his way. He made a thousand different conjectures as to how and from what side the beast would run out and how he would come his way. He prayed with the passionate compunction with which men pray in moments of intense emotion arising from trivial causes. Why was it to thee, he said to God, to do this for me? I know thou art great, and that it is a sin to ask this, but for God's sake make the wolf come my way, and let Caray get his teeth in his throat and finish him off in sight of uncle, who is watching from over there. A thousand times during that half hour, Rostov cast intent, strained, anxious glances over the thicket at the edge of the forest with the two scraggy oaks rising above the aspen undergrowth at the eroded brink of the ravine, and Uncle's cap just visited, just visible behind a bush on the right. No, that won't be my luck, thought Rostov. It would be worth anything, but it won't happen. I'm always unlucky. In cards, in war, in everything. Memories of Austerlitz and Dolokhov vividly flashed through his mind in rapid succession. Just once in my life to run down a full-grown wolf. I want nothing more, he thought, straining his eyes and ears, peering from left to right, listening for the slightest shade of variation in the sounds of the dogs. He glanced once more to the right and saw something running toward him across the open field. No, it can't be, thought Rostov, taking a deep breath as a man does at the fulfillment of something long hope. The greatest happiness had come to him, and, so simply, unheralded by pomp or fanfare. Rostov could not believe his eyes and remained in doubt for over a second. The wolf ran forward and heavily jumped over a gully that laid in her path. It was an old wolf with a gray back and a full reddish belly. She ran without haste, evidently sure of not being seen. Rostov held his breath and looked down at the dogs. They stood, or lay, not seeing the wolf, totally unaware of it. Old Karaid had turned his head and was furiously searching for fleas, barring his yellow teeth and snapping at his hindquarters. Eula, you, Eula, you, Eula, you, whispered Rostov, pouting his lips. Eula, Eula, you, whispered Rostov, pouting his lips. The dog sprang up jerking the iron rings of the leashes and pricking up their ears. Carey left off scratching his hind leg and got up, ears cocked and slightly wagging his tail, from which hung tufts of matted hair. Should I lose them or not? Nikolai asked himself as the wolf, moving away from the wood, came toward him. Suddenly the beast's whole aspect changed. She shuddered, seeing what she had probably never seen before. Human eyes fixed on her, and slightly turning her head toward Rostov, stopped, uncertain whether to go forward or back. Eh, no matter, forward, she seemed to say to herself, and without again looking back, continued on with a long, easy, but decisive lope. Eula, you, Eula, cried Nikolai in a voice not his own. Eula, Eula, cried Nikolai in a voice not his own, and his good horse of its own accord bore him downhill at breakneck speed, leaping over gullies to head off the wolf. The hounds, dashing even more swiftly, outstripped them. Nikolai did not hear his own cry, nor did he realize that he was galloping. He saw neither dog, he saw neither the dogs nor the ground over which he rode. He saw nothing but the wolf, which quickened its pace, was bounding in the same direction across the glade. The first to come into view, advancing on the beast, was the black spotted broad back Milka, nearer and nearer. Now she was gaining on her. But all at once the wolf turned its head and gave her a sidelong glance instead of spurting ahead as she had always done. Milka 
suddenly raised her tail and stiffened her forelegs. Eula, 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 shouted Nikolai. The red hound, Luyabim, darted forward from behind Milka, sprang violently at the wolf, and seized her by the hind leg, but instantly jumped aside in terror. The wolf crouched, ground its teeth, and again rose and bounded forward, followed at a distance of about two feet by the entire pack, which he which failed to gain on her. She'll get away. No, this is impossible, thought Nikolai, and went on shouting in a hoarse voice. Kare, Eula, 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 he cried, looking round for the old hound, who was his only hope now. Karai, his eyes on the wolf, and straining himself to the utmost of his declining strength, clumsily ran around to one side of the beast to cut her off. But the speed of the wolf's lope and the hound's slower pace made it plain that Carrot had miscalculated. Not far ahead, Nikolai could see the forest into which the wolf would certainly escape, should she reach it. A huntsman and dogs appeared in front of him, galloping almost straight forward the wolf, toward the wolf. There was still hope. A young hound Nikolai did not recognize, a long tan dog from someone else's leash, rushed head on at the wolf and all but knocked her over. The wolf righted herself more quickly than one would have expected, and gnashing her teeth flew at the tan hound, which with a piercing yelp fell with its head thrust to the ground, bleeding from a gash in its side. Caray, old fellow, weighed Nikolai. Thanks to the delay caused by this crossing of the wolf's path, the old dog with the matted tail was now within five paces of her. As if unaware of her danger, the wolf cocked an eye at Caray, tucked her tail still farther between her legs, and quickened her pace. But at that moment, Nikolai saw only that something was happening to Caray. In a flash, the hound was on the wolf, and they were pitching headlong into a gully that lay before them. That instant, when Nikolai saw the wolf in the gully struggling with the dogs, saw her gray coat and outstretched hen leg under them, her head with ears laid back in terror and gasping, Karade had, had her by the throat, was the happiest moment of his life. He had his hand on the pommel of the saddle, ready to dismount and stab the wolf, when all at once the beast's head was thrust up from the mass of dogs and her fur legs were on the edge of the gully. The wolf's teeth chattered. Karade no longer had her by the throat, and with a thrust of her hind leg, she sprang out of the gully, and having got free of the dogs, pushed toward with tail tucked in, Caray, her hair bristling, apparently either bruised or wounded, crawled out of the gully with difficulty. Oh, my God, why? cried Nikolai in despair. Uncles, huntsmen, came galloping across the wolf's pass from the other side, and the hounds again stopped the wolf. Again she was hemmed in. Nikolai, he groomed, uncle and his huntsmen were all circling the beasts, crying, Eula, 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 and shouting on the point of dismounting every time she crouched and starting forward again when she shook herself to move toward the covert where safety laid. At the very beginning of this coursing, Danielio, hearing the hunters yuli yuli had ridden out to the edge of the woods. He saw Carrie seize the wolf and chick his horse, supposedly the affair to be over. But when the huntsman did not dismount and the wolf shook herself free and took flight, Danielia galloped his own horse, not toward the wolf, but in straight line to the covert, just as Correa had done, to intercept the beast. Consequently, he came up to her just when she had been stopped a second time by Uncle's dogs. Danielo gapped, galloped up in silence, holding a drawn dagger in his left hand and flailing the heaving sides of his chestnut mount with his whip. Nikolai neither saw nor heard Daniela till his panting horse passed close by him, and he heard the sound of a falling body, and saw Danielia in the midst of the dogs on the wolf's back, trying to get her by the ears. It was clear to the hunters, the dogs, and the wolf that all was over now. The beast, its ears drawn back in terror, tried to get up, but the dogs st stuck to her. Daniela stood up, lost his footing, and as if sinking down to rest, fell with his whole weight on the wolf and seized it by the ears. Nikolai was about to stab the beast, but Daniela whispered, Don't. We'll truss her up. And shifting his position as he set his foot on the wolf's neck, they put a stick between its jaws and tied it with a leash, as if bridling her, then bound the legs, and Daniela rolled her over once or twice from side to side. 
Looking happy but exhausted, they lift the great live beast onto the back of a shying, snorting horse, and accompanied by the yelping dogs, took it to the place where they were all to meet. The hounds had taken two cubs and the borzos three. The huntsmen assembled with their booty and their stories, and they all came to look at the big wolf who, with her broad brow, head hanging down, and the gnaw stick between her jaws, gazed with great glassy eyes at the crowd of all dogs and men surrounding her. When they touched her, she jerked her bound legs and looked wildly yet simply at them all. Count Yilovit Adrich rode up and touched the wolf. Oh, what a big one, he said. Big, eh? He, s he said to the Daniel who was standing near him. She is, Your Excellency, answered Daniela, hurrying, doffing his cap. The count remembered the wolf he had let slip and Daniela's outburst. But you're a hot-tempered fellow, my lad, said the count. Daniela said nothing, but gave a shy, amiable, childlike smile. Chapter 6 The O Count went home. Natasha and Petya promised to follow immediately. But as it was all still early, a hunt went farther. At midday, they put the hounds into a ravine thickly overgrown with young trees. Nikolai, standing on the stubble field above, could see all his party. Facing Nikolai on the opposite side was a field of winter rye, and his own huntsman stood alone in a hollow behind a hazel bush. The hounds had scarcely been led in what Nikolai heard one he knew, Voltern, gave tongue at intervals. Other dogs joined him, now pausing, now again giving tongue. A moment later there was a cry from the preserve that they were on the track of a fox, and the whole pack joining together rushed along the fork of the ravine away from Nikolai and toward the rye field. He saw the whips in their red caps galloping along the edge of the ravine, saw even the dogs, and was expecting a fox to show itself at any moment in the rye field opposite. The huntsman standing in the shallow hollow started off, loosed his dogs, and Nikolai caught sight of a queer short leg get red fox with a bushy brush rushing across the field. The dogs bore down on it. Now they were drawing closer, and the fox was beginning to weave between them in sharper and sharper curves, trailing its brush, when suddenly an unfamiliar white dog darted in a black one followed, and they all mingled together, forming a star-shaped figure of scarcely moving bodies, heads to the center and tails out. Two huntsmen galloped up to the dogs, one in a red cape and the other stranger in a green coat. What's the meaning of this? Nikolai wondered. Where did the huntsman come from? He's not uncle's man. The huntsman dispatched the fox, then stood there a long time without strapping it to the saddle. Near them were the snap, snaffle horses, their saddles outlined above them, and the dogs lying on the ground. The huntsmen were waving their arms about in the air and doing something to the fox, and from the same spot a horn sounded, the signal agreed upon in case of a fight. That's Ilgin's huntsman having a row with our Ivan, said Nikolai's groom. Nikolai sent the groom to call his sister and Petya to him and rode at a walking pace toward the place where the whips were getting the hounds together. Several of the huntsmen rode to the scene of the quarrel. Nikolai dismounted and stood near the hounds with Natasha and Petya, who had ridden up, waiting to see how the matter would end. Out of the bushes came the huntsmen who had been fighting and rode up to the young master with the fox tied to his crupper. While still at a distance, he took off his cap and tried as he came up to speak respectfully, but he was pale and breathless, and his face was wrathful. He had a black eye and probably was not even aware of it. What happened over there? asked Nikolai. Why, he was running the fox right under the noses of our hounds. And it was my bitch, the mouse-colored one, that caught it. Go and have me up for it. Snatching the fox, I gave him one with that fox. I got it right here in my saddle. Maybe you like a taste of this, said the huntsman, pointing to his hunting knife and apparently imagining that he was still talking to his enemy. Nikolai, without wasting words on the man, asked his sister and Petya to wait for him and rode over to where the rival hunt of the 
Yilligan's was assembling. The victorious huntsman rode off to his, join his fellows, and there the center of a sympathetic, sympathetic and inquiring crowd recounted his exploit. The fact was that Legan, with whom the Rostovs had some quarrel and were at law, hunted over places that by custom belonged to Rostovs, and now, as if by design, had sent his men to preserve where the Rostovs were hunting and had permitted his men to course a fox their dogs had put up. Nikolai had never seen Yelagin again, but with his usual inability to temper his judgments and feelings, cordially detested him, and simply on the basis of rumors of his high hadness and bluster, and considered him his bittersweet, bitterest enemy. So now, excited and angry, he rode up to him, his whip clenched in his hand and fully prepared to take the most decisive and desperate measures in dealing with the foe. He had scarcely ridden beyond a assail salience of the wood when he saw coming toward him a stout gentleman in a beaver cap riding a handsome raven horse and accompanied by two grooms. Instead of an enemy Nikolai found in an Allegan, a courteous gentleman of imposing appearance who was particularly anxious to make the young Count's acquaintance. As he approached Rostov, he raised his beaver cap and said that he would greatly regret it what had occurred, that he would have the man punished for having tried to take a fox. Someone else's dogs were coursing. That he hoped they would become better acquainted and invited him to draw his covert. Natasha, fearing that her brother might do something dreadful, had ridden not far behind him in some agitation. Seeing that the enemies were exchanging friendly greetings, she rode up to them. Ligon lifted his beaver cap still higher to Natasha, and with an affable smile declared that the young countess resembled Diana, both in her passion for the chase and her beauty, about which he had heard much. To expedite his huntsman's offense, Ligon pressed Rostov to come to an upland of his about, a verst away that he usually kept for himself, and which he said with, was teeming with hares. Nikolai agreed, and the hunt, its numbers now doubled, moved on. The way to Ligon's upland laid across the fields. The huntsmen moved in a line side by side, and the masters rode together. Uncle, Rostov, and Ligon kept super serestipishly glancing at one another's hounds, trying not to be observed by their companions, but anxiously looking for rivals to their own dogs. Rostov was particularly struck by the beauty of a slender little black and tan thoroughbred bitch of Ladigan's, with muscles like a steel, a delicate muzzle, and a prominent black eyes. He had heard that Lanigan had some meddlesome hound, and in this beautiful bitch he discerned a rival to his Melka. In the middle of a Prosiak conversation begun by Ligan about the year's harvest, Nikolai pointed to the black and tan bitch. Fine little bitch you got there, he said in a casual tone. Keen is he, she. That one, yes, she's a good dog, gets what she's after. Which, pardon me, said Illigan differently of the black and tan years, for which this the year before he had given a neighbor three families of house serfs. So over your way to harvest is nothing to boast of, Count. He went on, resuming the conversation he had begun. Then, considering it polite to return the young Count's compliment, Yalagin looked over his dogs and picked up Milka, whose broad back caught his eye. That black spot at one of yours is fine. Well formed, he said. Yes, she's all right. She can run up, replied Nikolai. Oh, if only a good big hare would cross the field now, i show you what she can do he thought, and turning to his groom, said he would give a rubble to anyone who would put up a hair. I don't understand, continued Lagan, how some sportsmen can be so envious of one another's game or dogs. As for me, I can tell you, Count, I enjoy the whole thing, riding like this in such a pleasant company. What could be better? He again doffed off his beaver cap to Natasha. But as for reckoning up the pelts one has carried off, I'm not interested in that. Of course not! Nor could I be chagrined at someone else's dog-making, the catch and not mine. I just enjoy the chase. Don't you agree, Count? Besides, I consider a prolonged 
A2 came from one of the whippers in. He was standing on a knoll in the stubble, his whipped rays, and repeating his long draw cry. This call and the rays whip, whip meant that he saw a sitting hare. Ah, put it up, put up a hare, it seems, said Ligon carelessly. Well, let's course it, Count. Carelessly. Well, let's course it, Count. Yes, we must ride up. Shall we course it together? asked Nikolai, looking intently at Yerza and at Uncle's red rugai, the two rivals against whom he had not yet had a chance to pit his own dogs. What if they outdo my Milka from the first? he thought, as he rode with Uncle and Eligin toward the hare. A full grown one, asked Logan. Lyogen. As he approached the huntsman who had stared thought at the hare, and looking about with some excitement, he whispered to Yerza, aren't you Mikhail Nikariot, she asked, addressing uncle. The latter was riding with a scowl on his face. Why should I intrude? Why those dogs of yours? You've paid a, pri a village for every one of them. They're worth thousands. You, you two try yours against one another, and I'll just look at on. Rugai, hey, hey, he shouted. Ragusha, he added, involuntarily expressing his affection and the hope he would put in this red hound. Natasha could see and feel the excitement these two elderly men and her brother were trying to conceal, and was herself affected by it. The huntsman on the knoll was standing with unpraised, upraised whip, and the gentry rode up to him at a walking pace. The pack moving on the horizon turned away from the hare, and the huntsman, but not the gentry, also moved off. Everything was done slowly and deliberately. Which way is it pointing, asked Nikolai, after riding a hundred paces toward the groom who had put up the hare. But before the huntsman had time to answer, the hare, sensing the frost coming next morning, was unable to stay still and bounded up. The pack on the leashes rushed downhill in, the, in full cry after the hare. And from all sides, the borzois who were not on leash flew after the hounds and the hare. All the whips who had been slowly advancing, getting the hounds together with cries of stop, and the borzois with cries of a two, galloped across the field, setting the dogs on the hare. The tranquil Ligon, together with Nikolai, Natasha, and Uncle, flew along, reckless of where or how they went, seeing nothing but the dogs and the hare, and fearing only less they should for a single instant lose sight of the course. The hare they had put up was a strong and swift one. When he jumped up, he did not run off at once, but pricked up his ears, listening to the shouting and hoofbeats that came from all sides. He took a dozen leaps, not very quickly, letting the dogs gain on him, and at last, realizing his, jan his danger and choosing his direction, laid back his ears and darted off. He had been lying in the stubble, but in front of him was the autumn sowing where the ground was marshy. The two hounds of the huntsman who had put him up, having been the nearest, were the first to see and pursue him. But they had not gone far before Ligon's black and tan years had passed him, got within a length, and aiming at his scout, sprang upon the hare with terrible swiftness and rolled over and over, thinking she could hold of him. She could have hold of him. The hare arched his back and bounded off more swiftly than ever. From behind, Yursa rushed the broad hunch, black spotted Malka, and began rapidly gaining on the hare. Malushka, old girl, said Rose, Nikolai's triumphant cry. It looked as though Milka was about to pounce on the hare, but she overtook him and flew beyond, the hare having stopped short. Again, the graceful Yursa passed, pressed forward and seemed to hover, hover over the hare's scout as if measuring the distance so as not to make a mistake this time, but to seize him by the hind leg. Yersinka, little sister, Eligen, wailed in a voice unlike his own. Yerza paid no heed to his entry, Tritis. At that very moment, when she seemed about to seize her prey, the hare swerved and scudded along the bulk between the green field and the stubble. Again, Yerza and Milka, running side by side like a pair of carriage horses, began to gain on the hare. But it was easier for the hare to run on the bulk, and the dogs did not overtake him so quickly. Ruga, Rugusha, Fairfield, clear course, shouted a third voice just then. And Rugai, uncle, red hound, stretching and arching its back, caught up with the two foremost dogs, passed them, 
and spurting ahead with terrific abandon, knocked the hare off the bulk and into the rye field, sprang fiercely into the muddy field, sinking halfway up to his shoulders, and all that could be seen was the dog rolling over and over with the hare, the mud sticking to its back. The dogs formed a star-shaped figure around him. A moment later, everyone had drawn up around the cluster of dogs. Only the delighted uncle dismounted and cut off a pad, shaking the hair for the blood to drip off. Darting excited glances about him and unable to keep his hands and feet still, he kept talking about knowing to whom or what he was saying. That's a clear course. There's a dog for you. Outstrip them all, whether they cost a thousand or a rupal. Fair field, clear course, he kept saying, panting and furiously looking about as if he were berating someone, as if they were all his enemies who had insulted him, and only now at last he had succeeded in vindicating himself. So much for your thousand rupal dogs, Fairfield, Rugai. There's a pad for you, he said, throwing down the muddy pad he had just cut off. You earned it, Fairfield, clear course. She wore herself out, ran it down three times by herself, Nikolai was saying also not listening to anyone else, and regardless of whether he was heard or not. What do you make of cutting across like that, said Ligon's groom. Once she missed it and turned it aside like that, any cur could have caught it. Ligon was saying, flushed and breathless from his gallop and the excitement. At that same moment, Natasha, without even taking breath, gave vent to her delight in the ecstatic shriek so shrill that everyone's ears tingle. But that cry expressed what the others were expressing by all taking, talking all, talking at once. It was so strange that she must herself have been ashamed of so wild a cry, and the others would have been amazed at it at any other time. Uncle himself trussed up the hare, deftly and briskly flung it across his horse back, seeming to reproach them all by this gesture and with an air of not wishing to speak to anyone, mounted his bay and rode off. The others all followed, shamefaced and dispirited, and only much later they were able to recover their former affectation of indifference. For a long time they continued to glance at the red hound Rugai, who, his back covered with mud and clanking the ring of his leash, trotted along behind Uncle's horses with the serene air of a conqueror. To Nikolai, he had an air of saying, I'm just like any other dog till it's question of course, of coursing a hare. But when it is, look out. Sometime later, when Uncle rode up to Nikolai and addressed a remark to him, he felt flattered that after what had happened, Uncle deigned to speak to him. And I'm going to leave it off there. I'm going to continue with the series of Tolstoy's War and Peace. I'm sorry I haven't been around. Um, been just doing other projects. But uh, we're going to continue the series. This is... Uh, episode 47. I hope you keep uh, liking, comment, subscribe, or just watch, and I'll see you in the next episode. All right? Thank you. Bye.